Do you want to be the guy at 6 a.m. at the MGM Grand who's drunk, gambling by himself, miserable, trying to medicate the hole that he has inside? I just got back from with my son Nathan. We went to Las Vegas. I would rather show him what's out there and have him make a decision and be able to say, what kind of life do I want to live? You know, I can live like my dad, my mom, who get up at 5 a.m. every day and work out, have morning and evening routines, time block, eat healthy, or we could be like these people. So I want him to see what's out there and be able to exist in it without succumbing to it and crumbling. Because he's going to be tempted in his life. And this is a guided, structured experience with his father taking him through. As he gets older, he'll be exposed to more and more, with more and more independence, without my guidance. So it's important that right now, when he's 10 years old, I can show him these things with a lot of guidance and help form the way he's thinking about these situations. Hi everyone, welcome to the Rising Father Podcast. I'm Chris Rodak. I'm also going live in a bunch of different places. I'm going to talk to you about the ADCC tournament I just got back from with my son Nathan. We went to, to Las Vegas, had an amazing father-son trip there, and man, did we learn a lot. We saw a lot of craziness. It was my son's very first uh, time to Las Vegas, saw some crazy things, got inspired by the athletes, learned a lot of lessons. We developed, or I developed some philosophies to help guide life. And in our men's program, Men of Fire, we're going to do an exercise with that tomorrow. We're going to create some philosophies for different areas of our life to help guide our life. And then we had moments that we'll remember forever. So I'm going to take you through all those right now. So this is a live, and I'm also gonna, just going to use this as one of my solo podcasts. So make sure you subscribe to the Rising Father podcast with Chris Rodak if you're not already subscribed to that. Um, so first off... Like, why did we go? So the ADCC tournament uh, stands for Abu Dhabi Combat Club, and it's like the Olympics for jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu, for some reason, is not in the Olympics. It should be. Speed walking is in the Olympics. You know, some of the, or what is that thing where they uh, push the, uh, you know, that discus thing on the ground and they clean the ice, wherever that is. If some of those things are in the Olympics, jiu-jitsu should 1,000% be in the Olympics. But anyway... That could be a whole other tangent. We went to Las Vegas because this is where the tournament was being held, at the T-Mobile Arena. And it was from Wednesday through Sunday. We went there from Thursday through Monday just to see the finals, you know, the, the quarterfinals. Because from Wednesday through Friday, it's an open tournament, and whoever qualifies goes to the finals. So we went there, and Gordon Ryan was there. Um, you know, Felipe, uh, Felipe Pena was there. All the, the greatest in the world were there, and we were hoping to run into different people. We got a great deal on the staying at the MGM Grand. And as we were there, we saw a bunch of the different athletes. Some of the most famous, famous jiu-jitsu people in the world were there. And one morning, and we were eating breakfast, we looked over, and Cyborg, one of the greats of all time, was eating breakfast right next to us with another guy, uh, Hocha, and a, a whole table of 10 loud Brazilians having breakfast together. And one of our goals was to get a picture with one of these people that we ran into, but they were all having such a great time talking in Portuguese. And, you know, I didn't want to be the guy to walk over and say, Hey, can I get a picture, interrupt your breakfast so I can get a picture with you? I just wanted them to be able to have a good time. And that was the morning of the tournament where one of the guys was in the finals. He had headphones on, he was in the zone. And I really didn't want to get him out of his zone so I could take a picture for my son. Um, but anyway, I told Nathan, I said, Yeah, we didn't get a picture, but you can say forever that you. We're eating breakfast next to Cyborg and all these greats, like legends of jiu-jitsu. You got to eat breakfast right next to them, and Nathan just kept on looking over, watching the meat, and uh, we were talking about it. So we'll have that memory forever. So we went to see the jiu-jitsu tournament and get inspired. You know, I want Nathan to have all of these um, memories in his head and inspiration for the next years to keep him pushing in jiu-jitsu because he loves it so much. He loves basketball, CrossFit, Jiu-Jitsu, um, but like Jiu-Jitsu is his passion. He, he's getting really good at it, and he loves it. So I said, let's invest in this, take him on a father-son trip where we can have memories, we can connect, but also where he can just get crazy inspired, and that definitely happened. I'm going to take you through what inspired him in a little bit. So motivation for Jiu-Jitsu is why we went. Also, just to connect with my son. We were there for four nights, 
total five days, just the two of us. And this is something that I always wanted to do with my dad. We weren't able, you know, I grew up in a small two bedroom house with eight brothers and sisters. So we didn't have, we weren't able to go on five day Vegas trips with just one kid. So there's something I always wanted. I want to give him something that I always wanted. And just to have memories that we can talk about forever. You know, even on the way home, we were talking about the crazy people we saw and just everything that we saw in Vegas in a tournament. Already we have memories. And I had Nathan. I said, hey, bring this journal. I gave him one of my Rising Father journals. And I said, bring this journal and keep track of what we do so you can have these memories. One of the things that I did that I'm so grateful I did is when my kids were even younger, two through five, um, and I still occasionally do it now, is I kept a journal of just funny things they said and did, situations. And one of the times we were eating, we went to the Gordon Ramsay Burger Restaurant, which we both agreed was the best burger we've ever had. Uh, me and Nathan love watching Kitchen Nightmares and Hotel from Hell and all those things when Gordon Ryan's going crazy yelling at people. So we went to a Gordon Ramsay Burger Restaurant. Nathan really wanted to go to a Gordon Ramsay Restaurant. So we went there, and... Um, Nathan got a burger. He said it was the best in the world. I said, I said, yeah, mine was the best I ever had. Um, but like, yeah, memory we'll always have forever and just amazing food as well. Forgot where I was going with that. But anyway, so we went to the ADCC tournament and it's a T-Mobile arena, huge arena. And it was pretty packed. It wasn't packed like a NBA game or something like that. It was probably like 75% full and it was all day. So you can get there at 8 a.m. And, and stay till like 8 p.m. So people kind of came and went and were there for the big fights. Like Gordon Ryan Super Fight, it was packed for that. But there's also hours and hours of matches. So the first day we show up and we got there kind of towards the beginning. We went in the Lazy River at, our, at the MGM and we toured Vegas for a little bit. And then we said, all right, we're, we want to go for about four hours, four hours of jiu-jitsu, then we'll go home, back to the hotel, maybe swim a little bit, have some dinner, then go back for the super fight. Because grap or, uh, not grappling industries, um, Flow Grappling was one of the people hosting it, and they had a schedule. They had a tentative schedule. And it's this is one of our first big mistakes is and, and lessons learned. And they said that the super fight between on day one between Gordon Ryan and Pena was going to be at 8 p.m. They said tentatively 8 p.m. She said, oh, great. So we watched four hours of jujitsu, left at around 4 p.m., went back to our hotel. But we said, okay, we have four hours, of, we have a four hour break. So we're going to leave, we're going to eat dinner, swim, come back, watch two hours of jujitsu, and watch the super fight. So we wanted to get six hours of jujitsu in that first day. So we watched four hours of jujitsu, we go back to our hotel, we swim, we eat dinner, come back at like 6.15, no cars in the parking lot, T-Mobile Arena is empty, you see one worker there. I say, what happened? Where is everyone? I thought the super fight was going to start two hours from now. He's like, oh, it just ended like 30 minutes ago. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, oh, yeah, it just, like everyone's gone. He's like, I don't want to tell you, man. It's just a random worker. He said, I don't want to tell you. Like it's, it's, it's done. So the lesson learned was as fast as the tournament goes, it goes. The schedule really means nothing. It was supposed to start at 8 p.m. We got there at 6.15, and it was over 30 minutes ago. And as we showed up, there were people getting out of Ubers and taxis in the, with the exact same situation as us, and they were looking around, knocking on the window, trying to get in early for the super fight that was done 30 minutes earlier. So that was the first day. We saw some great matches. Um, and then the second day was the long day. This was Sunday. We were there for 10 hours. We got there at 10 a.m. Um, and then we got there like 10.17. And we were freaking out because we were 17 minutes late. Nathan especially was freaking out. He's like, Dad, are we going to miss the whole thing? We got there at 10.17. The morning of, we went to Fremont Street. I wanted to show him Fremont Street Sunday morning when it wasn't insane. Fremont Street in Vegas is people watching Central. That's people are drunk on the ground and... You know, it's just madness. You know, there's Chippendale people walking around. And all that's like Friday night, Saturday night craziness. You can barely move in there. So let's go Sunday morning when there's going to be no one there. And there was no one there. So we walked up and down the street. There's some restaurants. There's some cool things to see. The ceiling is like a giant LED-ish type of screen where it has a 
uh, outline of, or um, basically a movie of the sky, and there's music the whole time. So it's a cool thing I wanted Nathan to see. So he walked around there for about an hour, Ubered back to the T-Mobile, got there at like 10.17, freaking out that we were 17 minutes late, and then we stayed for another 10 hours because it was quarterfinals, semifinals for men and women, and then an absolute division, which is anyone can fight anyone despite your weight, and then there was a super fight with Gordon Ryan. So we stayed all the way for that. Um, and there were some exciting moments, but also a lot of boring moments. Like that's the thing about jujitsu is if you're into jujitsu and you're a jujitsu practitioner, you can see a lot of things that other people don't see. And it's a lot more interesting to you. Like the Gordon Ryan fight was pretty boring. If you're not a jujitsu practitioner, and even if you are, I mean, there were people next to us. there, definitely practitioners yelling about how boring it was, but I bought one of the Gordon Ryan instructionals. I went to one of his um, master classes with Donaher, and we he really instructed us on his technique and strategy of going slow, applying pressure, just kind of crushing the life out of the guy. And I've taken taken that into my own jujitsu as well. So I appreciated what he was doing. It's not he's not a cartwheeling over guys, jumping up doing flips. He's not that kind of person. Whenever he does it, he's just Perfectly mechanical, slow, crushing force, squeezes the life out of you, leaves no room for error, and it can take a long time. So he's like goal-oriented when he does his jiu-jitsu. He says, I want to win the fight. What's the most efficient way I can win the fight? It's by this, and it's not by turning the other guy into a pretzel and standing on my head and doing cartwheels over him and doing you know all this crazy stuff that some people do. It's like, no, I'm going to slowly pressure you into submission and make you want to kill yourself in the process. And that's what he did. So kind of boring to watch, but I appreciated it. And even Nathan appreciated it 10 hours in, you know, we're at like an hour eight. I was surprised my 10 year old son, you know, they played the dance music. He was up dancing, having a great time. He was still really, really into it. Um, but there was a match that was unwatchably boring, and that was Bia Mesquita and Adele uh, Fornarino, if I'm saying those names right. Probably not. But one was uh, Adele is from Australia. Bia, I think, is from Brazil. And oh my God, it was 20 minutes long. And Adele was trying to make something happen, but Bia was just in the turtle, which is a, it was just a defensive position where you're basically cradled on the ground, head down knees to your elbows, face down, just playing defense. So basically it was 20 minutes of her in a turtle position, not moving. That was it. And then this was seven, eight hours in. And I didn't think I was going to be there that long. I was hoping this, because the jujitsu match can last 25 minutes with overtime, or it could last 30 seconds, which some of them did. And like the first day, it ended four hours early because how fast everything was going. So I was hoping this was going to be one of those days where everything moved up three, four hours and we could go back and get some swim time in. But it didn't. We were there for a whole 10 hours. And this is at hour seven or eight. And Adele's trying to make things happen. She's pushing it, trying to play some offense. But this lady is just in turtle, holding on to one of her limbs so she can't do anything. And I felt I was getting so frustrated watching because I hate rolling with people like that who only play defense refuse to do offense and just don't move and for them it's like well i win if i just sit here and that's one of the down parts of jujitsu and people started yelling and booing um and we wish that they would have just broke it up like just break up the fight you know break up the fight and reset like they do in boxing if people clinch for i don't know boxing but whenever you clinch and just hold on to the guy for too long, they just break you up and you can start going again. I was like, come on, please. I can't, we're seven, eight hours into this. I can't watch these two just lay on their knees for 20 minutes. And they gave uh, Bia a couple penalties because of that. So the score was zero, zero after 20 minutes. And then the announcer called overtime. I was like, Oh my God, I can't do this anymore. And then luckily, because she had penalties, they just gave the win to Adele. So that's an example of a boring jiu-jitsu match. And if you are if you were there, not a jiu-jitsu practitioner, you would have wanted to kill yourself because that is, that is as boring as it gets. However, there's some other matches that are really, really exciting. Like there's these other two ladies 
forget their names. Um, I think Adele was one of them. And they're just like WWE slamming each other, like lifting each other up, doing these wrestling and judo takedowns, throwing each other on the mats, and the whole crowd's going crazy and screaming. Um, some guys had matches where it was really, really fast paced and moving, and like that's fun to watch. You know, that's you can appreciate it. Plus, it's actually entertaining. So there's boring moments, exciting moments. But luckily, I was with uh, my son, who can appreciate jujitsu, knows what he's watching, and also is just okay being a little bored at times and staying for long hours. I know I know a lot of people with kids who, you know, 30 minutes of that, they would have been screaming and asking for snacks and lightsabers and all kind of stuff, and they, like 10 hours of that, they would not have been able to handle it. Um, one thing I did like was how fast everything moved. Like one match happened, then another match happened, and it was just bam, 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 af one after another. So that was great. And Nathan got just super, super motivated when he was watching. As we were watching, he said, Dad, do you think in two years I could be at the ADCC championship? I said, yeah, you actually could be. You could do because on Thursday and Friday, they had the kids tournament. So Friday was the kids finals. And Started, I think, on Thursday, maybe on Wednesday. But kids from all over the world came, and it was the same thing. It was like the Kids World Championship. And you can earn your spot there. They have opens. Like they'll have like a Pittsburgh Open and a New York Open. You have to fight your way to the top. And then if you're the best, you move on to the next round. And if you're the best of the best, you make it to the ADCC Championship. So, yeah, Nathan, Nathan, actually, realistically, you could, if you practice your butt off over the next two years, um, and don't give up. Yeah, actually you could if you do these things. It's not a fantasy. You really could do that in two years. Um, so he said, okay, that's going to be one of my goals. It's said, great. So whether he makes it or not, it doesn't matter. It'll be an amazing lesson either way. If he practices his butt off over the next two years, gets in amazing shape, gets super disciplined and consistent, gets really, really good at jujitsu, and he doesn't make it, he's still practice his butt off, got really good at jiu-jitsu, very disciplined, in great shape, and will learn a great lesson on failure. If he does make it, great. Either way, it's a win. It's a massive lesson learned. Um, so he said, all right, so he was asking me, he's like, what do I have to do? What do you think I need to work on? I said, well, you got to work on our takedown, so maybe we could start wrestling because he get, his school has a really good wrestling program. He said, okay, I want to do wrestling. And then he said, maybe I could do private lessons again. There's a couple months where we did private lessons a few years ago. So I said, sure, we can look for some private lessons in jujitsu. And then he, went, he said, I want to take class more seriously. So, you know, he, he already is one of the most serious people in his jujitsu class, but now he's like amped up. He wants to be in his mind. He wants to be a world champion right now. So great. That's one of the main reasons I took Nathan to this was to be a world champion. Um, so, Mission accomplished, and that was just one of them. So now Nathan wants to get in better shape. He wants to take CrossFit more seriously. He's in CrossFit. Um, he just got second place in a CrossFit competition. Uh, he wants to take jujitsu more seriously, and he wants to work on his discipline. All those great things because we invested in this trip to Las Vegas. Um, now just like let's talk about Vegas. My second time there, I went eight years ago for a business event thing. I went by myself. Nathan's first time. So this is my second time. Nathan's first time. And yeah, if you've ever been to Vegas, you know, it's a little crazy. You see some crazy people. The nightlife is insanity. You walk up and down that main drag with all the resorts. And, you know, we were there on Friday night, Saturday night. Um, we walked around Thursday night, too. And you can barely move. It's so packed. You see the, the Vegas girls walking around trying to get you to take their picture. You see... Um, bands playing, guys with mics singing that shouldn't be singing. You see all the, you know, the Bellagio um, water things coming out, water things coming out of the ground. You see all the amazing, you know, the Hard Rock Cafe, the the M and M store. There's like a Netflix pop up thing. The New York New York Resort, which looks like the outline of New York with a roller coaster on top of it. You know, Vegas is there to look crazy just to really soak you in um so like vegas is made so that your senses are just overloaded and that's what happened 
um, we were there and we walked around. We just, everything we, we looked at, we were turning and saying, oh my goodness, look at that. Oh my goodness, look at that. And Nathan just absolutely loved it. Um, so when we were there, we got to look at things we wanted to mimic and things we didn't, right? You know, that's one of the, whenever I'm spending time with my kids, it's, you want to spend time with them, but I'm also their father. So I also have to guide their life. I can't just go to Vegas and let Nathan take in everything like a fire hose and not instruct him along the way. You know, it has to be a guided experience. It's he's taking in everything, but we also have to talk about what he's seeing. You know, we, we stayed at the MGM Grand, which the nightly rate was surprisingly cheap. But you can also spend thousands and thousands of dollars there every day, right? You know, one diet, uh, uh, Diet Dr. Pepper, I think, was $8 for a bottle. I'll get into that. I'll get into the other ridiculous price things later. I have that on my list to talk about. Um, so, you know, it was 6 a.m. Because of the time difference, it's three hours later. So we, we were just naturally waking up earlier. So we'd be walking around the MGM Grand at 5, 6 a.m. And there's people already hammered, drinking, gambling by themselves. You know, just guys looking miserable with a drink in hand playing slot machines by themselves at 5.30 a.m. And Nathan had questions about that. He's like, what are they doing, Dad? You know, why are they doing that? So we talked about that. You know, do you... And he said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be one of those guys. Well, okay. Now, we... We... Um, yeah, I let Nathan have desserts and all that, but we didn't... We weren't, like, going to the buffet and gorging ourselves until we threw up. And, you know, we weren't binging and taking part in the excess of it and that's what i'm talking about when i mean that you can take everything in it's almost like being in virtual reality when you're there you know it's like you put you're sitting at your home you put on an apple vision pro headset and you say take me to to vegas or take me to some crazy scene and every single thing you see is just madness you know it's like all you can eat all you can drink P crazy people everywhere so when you're in that environment it's really easy to be tempted to just be like everyone else because every single one of your senses is being attacked. Every single one of your senses is being tempted to be out of a line with yourself. So you have to be extremely disciplined. You have to have philosophies, which I'm going to talk about. You have to have philosophies for, okay, when I am around people who are not like me and are living a different way than I want to live, what do I do? So your reason for living the way you do has to be greater. There has to be a bigger payoff than participating in what other people are doing right now. So that's what we experienced. It was, it's 5.30 a.m. There's these people, you know, eating and drinking and gambling at 5.30 a.m. What, what are we going to do? So we just, we got our steps in. We walked around. Um, we swam when that was open. We looked for the gym, which unfortunately wasn't open until later. But then we just walked outside and walked all the way around and found breakfast and called home and gave the girls, my wife and uh, daughter, gave them tours of Las Vegas and did try to keep try to keep our routines as healthy and normal as possible. But as we observed craziness, we talked about it. And the, the lesson was, there are people who are living like that. Is that how you want to live? Do you want to be the guy at 6 a.m. at the MGM Grand who's drunk gambling by himself, miserable, not happy with his life, um, trying to medicate the hole that he has inside. Do you want to be that person? You know, we get to talk about those kind of things. Um, and I could have shielded him from all this, right? Like I could, we went to the, there's five pools at the MGM Grand and there's a massive lazy river, which was awesome. But, at the pool towards the end, you know, there's guys who are there for their bachelor parties and guys who are there just to drink for whatever reason. There's people with just buckets of cans and bottles of beer. And Nathan was like, oh, my God, Dad, look at all those beer cans. Like a couple of guys had like 20 beer cans in buckets, just them, just drinking by the pool, just hammered. I saw one guy drunk out of his mind walking up to these ladies who were sober and I, he, well, they walked past us, and they were talking to each other. 
um, they were talking about how they, what they were going to do, their plan for hitting on these ladies. And it, I was just, oh my God, thank you. This is going to be so fun to watch. So the guy's drunk. He's talking to his friend. And then they're like, okay, a lady in purple, she's mine. I heard one guy say that. And this obese, belligerently drunk guy walks up to her, and like puts his arm around her and tries to make a move. And she's just disgusted looking at her friend like, oh my God, get off me. Shuts him down. He walks out of the pool dejected, not knowing why he was just shut down. And those people are out there, right? Those people are there, and that is their life. And Nathan got to see that. That wasn't all the people in the pool. Some of the people in the pool were fine, and it was a jiu-jitsu tournament, so there's also a lot of jiu-jitsu people there. Um, so a lot of people, they're not just getting hammered. But he got to see people like that. So I could have shielded him from all of that, right? I could have told him that stuff doesn't happen and not let him see any of the craziness. But I think I would rather show him what's out there and have him make a decision and be able to say, what kind of life do I want to live? You know, I can live like my dad, my mom, who get up at 5 a.m. every day and work out 5.30 a.m. every day and <clears throat> do cardio, have morning and evening routines, time block, eat healthy. Um, we could do that or we could be like these people. So I want him to see what's out there and be able to exist in it without succumbing to it and crumbling. You know, it's I wanted him to, because he's going to be tempted in his life. And this is a guided, structured experience with his father taking him through. I'm holding his hand, taking him through his experience. I didn't just drop him off in Vegas and say, well, let's see how you do. It's like, no, I'm showing him a path forward with my guidance. And as he gets older, he'll be exposed to more and more, with more and more independence, without my guidance. So it's important that right now, when he's 10 years old, I can show him these things with a lot of guidance and help form the way he's thinking about these situations. Say, no, look, you don't have to do what your friends do. And say, oh, say you're, you're here with 10 friends and nine of them are just getting hammered and you don't want to. You don't have to do that. You could be your own man and be the one leading. You don't have to be the follower. So we talked about that because he, he's brought up that before of, you know, sometimes when I'm with my friends, you know, they want to do something I don't want to do and how that makes them uncomfortable. I said, okay, well, guess what? Are you a leader? Yeah. Well, I guess, well, yeah, well, leaders don't follow people. Leaders have their own standards. You're aligned with just yourself. Leaders do what they want to do, live their own life, and let other people follow them. The only reason you would abandon your own standards and do what someone else is doing is if you think your life isn't worthy enough to go all in on. You think someone else's life is worthy enough to follow, but the way you're living your life isn't worthy. So no, you never you don't abandon yourself and do what someone else is doing. That's pure pressure, right? It's you get pressured into living the way someone else is. So why why abandon yourself so quickly? These are lessons that we learn just by being in Vegas looking at the crazy people. You, know, you see a group of twenty guys just hammered and you know you know there's some people in there that don't want to be doing that, that are pressured into doing it. So I could have shielded him, but I decided that to let him see that and let him choose the way he wants to live. And he, we t through these conversations, it's clear that, yeah, he, he likes what his parents are doing. The other w reason that we went to Vegas was just to connect, um, me and my son, just to really connect and have a memory that we have forever. And over and over again, he kept on saying how much he loved the trip. Um, he, you know, towards the beginning of the summer, he, he kept on saying that it's okay that summer ends because it's going to end with you and me going on this Vegas trip. And like I said, this is something that I would have loved to have done with my dad, this kind of thing. And I wanted to give that to him. So he kept on thanking me after every, every single meal we had. He said, dad, thank you. In the middle of the meal, dad, thanks so much for doing this. This is amazing. He kept on saying that over and over again. Then as we were walking through, um, the resort, he said, how he wants to take his future family here. He was talking about his daughter he's going to have some day, son, his wife he's going to have some day, dogs he's going to have some day, and how he's going to take them to Vegas. He's going to bring me along. And, you know, we'll have a fun trip. He wants to redo this trip with his own family. Um, he's talking about how much he missed his mom and his sister. And just talking about how he will remember this forever. 
And I got him a journal, um, one of our Rising Father journals, and I said, just take notes of what we're doing. I think I mentioned this earlier. I said, take note of what we're doing so you never forget it. And on the airplane plane ride home, he journaled about our trip, but he journals differently. He does art journals. He draws murals of what happened. So he drew a picture of the main strip of Las Vegas, and he had little pictures of different memories we had, like talking to a guy dressed in Mickey Mouse, and he had a picture of Gordon Ryan, and he had a picture of some. He has he drew pictures of the memories that he had. So that was his, his way of journaling, and that's fine. You can journal any way you want, but it was a beautiful drawing, um, and that's how he's going to remember this forever. And even before this podcast, I said, Nathan, what are some of the things you remembered? He brought up, um, they have these different characters on the main strip that you can take pictures with, and then they tell you, hey, tip me for that. You know, give me 50 bucks for that picture. And we saw Mickey Mouse um, and Minnie Mouse characters. So Nathan ran up and took a picture with them. And then as soon as he was done, he pulled his mask off, and it was a short Mexican guy. <laughs> Nathan just started busting out laughing. He's like, oh, my God, I wasn't expecting that. Because we went to Disney World earlier this year, and you never know who's underneath them. But here they whip their mask off and ask you for a tip right away. And that was one of the funniest things Nathan saw the entire time. So what are some of the lessons we learned? Like, What are some of the lessons for Nathan that happened during this, uh, this trip to Vegas for ADCC? Well, we worked on his confidence. And how do I do that? I do that through interacting with different people. Because that's something that I struggled with as a, as a little kid, was talking to strangers, talking to other adults and really advocating for myself. You know, as a teacher for a long time, we talked, we said it's good for kids to advocate for themselves. You want them to have the confidence to stand up for themselves and ask for what they want. So while we're at restaurants, I always make my kids order for themselves. I never order for them. You know, I won't say Nathan wants pancakes. I have Nathan has to say it and then he has to say it loud enough, strong enough and confident enough for um to say what he wants. If there's something wrong with his food. He has to have the confidence to say, I, this needs fixed, which that alone is, I know many adults who don't have the, the guts to even do that. Another example is we went to the airport and Nathan had to find our gate. And he kept on asking me, he said, Dad, do you think I'm old enough to go to the airport by myself? And I said, yeah, you can. I don't, I don't know if it's allowed or not, um, but you are old enough if you know what to do. So we kind of did a practice run. I said, here we are. We walked in the airport. I said, you have to find our gate. And he was able to do it. I gave him the boarding pass, and he had to walk us through the airport, look at the signs, follow the signs, and take us all the way to the gate. Because just in case he would ever get lost for some reason, like say he gets turned around, I want him to know how to navigate through an airport, find where we're supposed to go, find customer service, find people that can help him. You know, it's preparing for the worst situation in a controlled environment. It's bringing danger into his life in a controlled way so that when danger comes unintentionally, he's prepared for it. Not to go on a long tangent, but that's why you do intentional suffering in the gym and with your diet so that when unintentional suffering comes, you can handle it better. So that was one example. Another example is we're at the huge lazy river at the MGM Grand and the um, inner tubes were $38 for the cheapest dollar store inner tubes you can imagine. So it's $38 for an inner tube and for them to fill up your inner tube was $10. So they have a $10 first time fill up fee. So they're charging $10 for air. Um, and I'll get into more of the ridiculous things in a little bit. But yeah, so it's an inner tube for $38 and $10, $10 for air. And the one time we went to the Lazy River, we were only there for an hour. I said, sorry, man, we're just not going to. <laughs> you know, we, we already spent a ton of money on this trip. We, the foods are really expensive, tickets, everything. I said, we're, I, that's something I cannot do right now is spend 50 bucks on one, and so if, on one inner tube. And if I wanted an inner tube also, it would have been $100 for one hour of floating around this Lazy River. And let me tell you, it wasn't worth that much. So I said, sorry, buddy, we're just, we can swim in it. We can go around. I said, if someone gives you an inner tube, you can do it. You can, uh, you can use it. And then he saw 
And it, right by a lifeguard, there was an inner tube just sitting there. We took three laps around. It was still sitting there. So he said, Dad, do you think that inner tube's open? I said, well, you can go ask. And this was the lesson. This was him advocating for himself, being confident, talking to strangers, and talking to adults while I'm there and having the guts to do it. Because hundreds of people floated past that. We're probably thinking, man, I wonder if I could just grab that. So I said, all you have to do is ask. And he was a little scared. He said, ah, I don't really want to. I said, why not? What's the worst thing that can happen? You ask and they say, yeah, it's somebody's. Or you ask and they say, no, you can have it. So we walked, we floated around two more times and he was just nervous and scared to ask his lifeguard about that inner tube. So he said, I'm not going to do it for you. If you want to float on it, you need to advocate for yourself. You need to be confident and independent enough to just go up to his lifeguard and say, hey, is anyone using that? If not, can I take it? So finally he does. He swims over to the lifeguard. He says, is this anyone's? And she says, nope. Do you want it? He goes, yep. She gave it to him. Boom, we save 50 bucks. And then for the rest of the 30 minutes, he had this floaty, you know, this um, raft to float around on. And I'm sure hundreds of other people would have done that in an instant had they known she would have just said yes. And that is something I'm working on with him is what is the worst thing that can happen? So it's a lesson on failure. It's a lesson on, um, you know, perfectionism. It's jumping into things without them have, without needing a perfect outcome. That's the lesson here. It's you want something. You just have to try it and be okay with the consequences. So what's the, you go up and ask for an inner tube. What's the absolute worst thing that can happen? She says, no, it's somebody else's. What if she even gets mad at you and says, why would you ask that? Which would never happen. You, know, you say, oh, sorry, and you leave. So yeah, just go do what you want. And there was a lot of situations during this, during these four days where we didn't know if we were allowed into a room or didn't know if we were allowed to do something. And we just had to make the decision, are we not going to do this thing or are we going to do it and just deal with the consequences and ask? Such as I didn't know that MGM owns so many resorts and facilities and all these things. And I couldn't find a gym. So I asked somebody, where's a gym? And they said, oh, there's a 24-hour gym, blah, 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 down this way. So all the resorts are connected by tunnels. And um, I went, me and Nathan went to this one gym. And there was through double doors and there were security guards and it was a different resort and hotel. And I didn't know, I didn't know if I was allowed in there or if I was allowed to use their things. Cause normally if it's a different hotel, you can't use it. So we just walked in and Nathan was like, are we allowed in here? I said, I don't know. But the worst thing that can happen is they could tell us to turn around. We just walked in, um, went up to the gym, walked inside, looked around, saw that we could use it. We ended up not using it. Um, because the timing didn't work out. And then on our way out, we saw somebody who worked there. We said, hey, we can, can we use this gym? They're like, yep, it's open for everyone. Great. Just found out. If she said no, we'd say, oops, sorry. That's it. These small situations stop people from, from doing things. You know, they, they stop you from trying things. They stop you from advocating for yourself. They, they just keep you stuck in fear. I do not want Nathan to have that. I don't want him to take on that characteristic. I definitely had that characteristic of I'm afraid to ask this person for something so I'm or I'm afraid to say what I really want to say so I'm not going to. No, I, you order at a restaurant and you're like, you really don't want that. You want the other thing, but you're afraid to say. I don't want him to have any of those characteristics. I want him to, him to be strong and confident and just go for what he wants and deal with the consequences. Be confident in himself enough to just deal with the consequences. Not be stuck in fear. Because so many men are stuck in their lives in fear over the silliest little things. Oh my goodness, what if? What if? What if? But I can teach him to this in a controlled environment since he's living with me on these type of trips and every day through these small situations. Starts with just ordering by yourself at the restaurant. Or saying a small situation is Nathan likes cheeseburgers and he only likes cheese on it. Um, he ordered his burger like that one time, came back, had other things on it. He was like, oh, I only wanted cheese. I said, okay. So all you have to do is tell her that 
You want another one with just cheese? He could either say, ah, oh, it's fine, and settle for not getting what he wants um, for, fewer, for, for pure fear of interacting with somebody, or he could just confidently, assertively, without judgment, without being an a-hole, just say, hey, um, do you mind making me another one or taking this off, or I want this. That's what I want him to be able to do. I want him to be able to be confident, assertive, without being judgmental, without being an a-hole. Because you have to do that as a leader of your family, right? If you want to be a father and husband, you have to be confident and assertive, not passive-aggressive, lead without judgment, without being an a-hole. So it starts with advocating for yourself. Um, yeah, and the, and the MGM Grand, to talk about that, I told you I would say some of the stuff that was insanely expensive. Um, like $50 for an inner tube, $10... Ten dollars for air. Um, my son's waving to me. And eight dollars, eight or nine dollars for a diet coke. You know, you they have a little convenience store in the MGM Grand. One candy bar is five dollars. Uh, bottle of water is like ten dollars. Or you could just go right outside and there's a CVS and Walgreens and get everything you need for a fifth of the price. Um, the food, the restaurants are amazing, unbelievable food we ate at Wolfgang Puck, which wasn't crazy expensive. We got a really nice, good uh, brick oven pizza. I think that was $22. So I'm okay paying that for that. I got a really good chicken dinner that was 40 bucks at a Wolfgang Puck restaurant. I'm okay paying that. But then you go to the food court, and there's crappier food for that's just as expensive so you can get ripped off there so if you go to these resorts at, in las vegas you got to be prepared for the ripoff and um, plan appropriately we went to the cvs and filled our backpacks with water and drinks they tend to get prime of course and just snacks for our hotel filled up our backpack and walked in if i would have paid for those things at the convenience store at in at the mgm grand it would have been 200 bucks so, very expensive if you partake in that. Great food, but also lots to do. Um, last thing I want to talk about is developing philosophies. And this is some, something we're going to work on in my program tomorrow on our call. And Jim Rohn talks about this a lot. Tony Robbins talks about it. But mostly Jim Rohn in his workshops. And he says, you need a philosophy to guide your mind and guide your habits and how you're going to see the world. If part of your life is not going well, it's probably because you do not have a constructive philosophy guiding your actions. So, and I realized on this trip, I need to develop more philosophies and be more vocal about it with my kids, such as eating. Nathan knows in, in general that we eat healthy. He knows in general that we track macros, that we don't try to overdo it, that we try to be in control, but we don't have a specific philosophy for it. And that came to my mind because within one hour, I think he asked for a s different snacks 20 times after I gave him a snack. You know, he asked for a snack, so we had a snack. And then we, two minutes later, we'd pass up something and ask for another snack. Or we'd ask him, and I just had to say, no, 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 no. I said, oh, well, this, he's saying, asking so many times because he hasn't bought into a philosophy on how to control yourself eating. So a simple philosophy that I could repeat could just be part of the Rodak lexicon and phrases that we repeat is everything you eat goes somewhere. And that's I was on the plane. I was just trying to think of philosophy, something I could say that makes sense. Everything you eat goes somewhere. Either it turns into poop, <laughs> turns into sorry to gross you out, turns into fat, turns into muscle, turns into energy. But everything you put in your mouth will go somewhere. So you have to think about that before you eat something. And then also on money because. We, I bought Nathan a souvenir. We bought my wife and daughter a souvenir, but same thing. He wanted to buy everything, everything we bought. If I let, if I gave Nathan my credit card, a hundred thousand dollars would have been spent because everything we passed up, he asked if we could buy it. So I said, "Oh, we don't have a. Ph I need to develop a better philosophy on spending money and share it with my kids." And that is, if you spend all your money today, you won't have any tomorrow. And that was I. And after I said that, we were at a gift shop looking for souvenirs for Nathan or for Lauren and Sarah, my wife, 
And that came to my head. I said, you know, man, if you spend all your money today, you won't have any tomorrow. He's like, oh, you're right. And that was the end of it. And then he didn't ask me anymore when we were there. So that, and I thought to myself, huh, that's a, that's a philosophy for why you shouldn't spend all your money. Just a really simple thing you can say that sticks in your brain that when Nathan's older he can, and he's thinking about he's on his own, maybe he's at Vegas on his own sometime, gets his first credit card, and he's tempted to just buy thing after thing. So he, something he can just repeat to himself. Also, spend money on things that give you a good life, not a good sensation. That's another philosophy for spending money. These are things I was just writing down and journaling about on the plane ride home. Spend money on things that give you a good life, not a good sensation. Because you only have a finite amount of resources. It's like a big pie graph. If you spend all of it the first day on things that just feel good right now, you don't have any left to spend. The last one, last philosophy was I thought about whenever um, you know Nathan was asking me to go on my phone a lot. He kept on asking me to go on my phone to look at YouTube or to play games. And that is spend your day like a pencil, not paper. What does that mean? That means that you want to be the one writing your story, not the one being written on. You want to live your life, not watch others live their life. And all, most of what is geared towards that age group on YouTube is watching other people live, right? It's like watching some family go on vacation or it's watching, it's watching some middle-aged guy play Minecraft or it's watching other people live their life instead of you living your life. And it's okay to watch that stuff in a controlled way. But once again, as fathers, we have to guide our kids' consumption of these things and we have to um, appropriately make sure that they're consuming things in a responsible way. So spend your day like a pencil, not paper. Just something simple that he can say, yeah, my dad always said spend your day like a pencil, not paper. So maybe I should get off my butt and go live a little bit. Be the one writing my story. These are just simple examples of philosophies to guide actions. So I have my own list of philosophies. And like I said, what we're going to do in my group tomorrow is come up with philosophies that guide our life and our family life, our family's lives. And the whole family has to be bought into it. You know, you can't just say, this is what we're doing. The whole f You have to say it in the right way. The whole family needs to be bought into it. And your whole family can contribute and decide on these family philosophies. What are we going to be known for? What goes on our family crest? The Rodax blank. Something Nathan came up with years ago was the best never rests. I, just, I love that. If you want to be the best, it means take your breaks sparingly. It means you keep on pushing yourself. That's a philosophy for living. It's a philosophy that guides your actions. Do you have philosophies that guide your actions that your kids know? Like, yeah, the Smiths never blank. Or when the road acts are tempted with blank we or the road acts are okay being leaders we don't follow anyone when you're at a party and everyone else is drinking and binging we're okay being disciplined that's a philosophy so these are these are rules guidelines principles to which you live your life that are repeatable that guide your habits and actions and thoughts so that is the recap of my Vegas trip the ADCC of connections, lessons, talking about the, the resort mindset, developing philosophies, talked about Vegas, um, talked about the actual tournament. And that's the, that's the podcast for today. So if you're not subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this. Please leave a five-star review. That really helps out. I got a lot of uh, reviews this past month, so I appreciate that. Please leave a five-star review if you've listened to it. And please share it with somebody. All right, guys. So I'm going to end right there. And I will talk to all of you later. If you need anything, feel free to reach out.